Hello, everyone, and welcome to yet another Lean In session. As always, I'm Michael Linke here at the Australian Institute of Architects, and it's great to have you with me once again. Today's Lean In focuses on looking at Tapestry. Tapestry is an open source database for architecture, engineering, construction, and real estate, and content curators from around the world sign up and submit open source data regarding building and project performance. Tapestry, which is a not-for-profit organisation, was founded by Ken Sanders and Jonathan Schechter with a mission to educate and inform the AEC industry with open source data, which will then in turn inform future design. The site has been created by industry for industry and is really particularly innovative when examining high-performance architecture, products and materials. The sharing of such data is designed to assist architects and engineers and designers when speaking to clients, and that gives them the ability to demonstrate where certain technologies or strategies have been previously implemented successfully. We're very pleased to have the founder of Tapestry join us today, Ken Sanders. He's going to provide us with an overview of the site, how firms can utilise the data and how they can contribute to its growth and how the platform can support you. Ken's had a 17-year career at Gensler as managing principal and board member. He currently holds multiple board member roles, is a fellow at the American Institute of Architects and a managing principal at Design Intelligence. And he joins me now live from San Francisco in the United States. Ken, welcome to the program. Great to have you with us. Michael, thank you so much. It's great to be here. And thanks to all of you for joining during your lunch hour, working from home, I imagine, for most of you. Um, I think what I'll do, I'm going to walk you through a few slides, and then I'd like to give a live demo of the Tapestry platform. And uh, can, can we get my, or is my screen sharing okay at this point? Uh, if we just get you to share your screen, Ken. Oh, okay. Here we go. That's what I need to do. Okay. That look good? Perfect. Everybody can see that. Okay, great. Yeah, so again, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here with all of you. Um, I'm based here in San Francisco. It's about 7 p.m. on Wednesday night. I know it's your lunch era, but again, thanks so much. Um, as Michael mentioned, um, I retired from Ganser at the end of uh, 2018. And as I approached that sort of transition in my career, I really thought a lot about how to give back to the industry that had been so good to me. And obviously, I had a lot of interesting technology. One of the roles I played at Gensler for over a decade was their chief information officer. And I've also been very passionate about sustainable design, uh, health and wellness, and so forth. And so I thought a lot about this and reached out to a lot of my colleagues uh, in the industry thinking about what could we do to really help uh, design professionals and engineers and builders and real estate owners do a better job of understanding and making more informed choices. And one of the things we can all observe, I think I'm not going to read this to you, but there's so much good information out there that is disclosed publicly uh, by design teams, by real estate owners, by product manufacturers about the things that they produce. And knowing that information helps us all uh, evaluate those things and make better design decisions. The problem is that so much of that information nowadays is still trapped inside of documents, it's stored in proprietary databases, often it's hidden behind paywalls, and it's disconnected from design software. And I think there remains this huge opportunity to work together as an industry to aggregate and organize information and put it to better use by all of us uh, in terms of designing better, more sustainable projects. This is sort of a visual of the current situation. The information comes from a lot of different places on the left hand side, and it's used in a lot of ways on the right hand side, it informs decision making. The problem is in the middle where all this information is scattered in literally hundreds of different places, disconnected from each other uh, and so forth. And it's very time consuming and costly for people to try to navigate all these different information pathways. Uh, it's a huge data fragmentation problem. So the question is, can we work together as an industry and start to cooperate and bring information on an open source basis into one place. And my position is really what we need as an industry is to share freely open source data with public interfaces that allow us to organize information better and put it to better use, whether it's design software or certification programs, or just letting a designer do a better job of comparing different uh, products. Basically, this is sort of a, a visual of what we have, a bunch of information silos 
And what we really want and need is a interconnected ecosystem that can grow over time. So uh, after thinking about this uh, a few years ago, uh, as Michael mentioned, Jonathan Schechter and I set up a nonprofit organization. It's actually called AEC Design Transparency. And the vision is really, I won't read these again, but we have a vision that's really focused around sustainable design, design resilience. And again, we want to integrate information in a way and make it freely available uh, so that it educates and informs people, not only practitioners, but also students uh, in college and even high school. So what we've been doing over the past couple of years is developing a new open source knowledge platform. It's freely available to the public. We are never going to charge money for it. And it's really been designed to support the diverse AEC ecosystem, including not only architecture and engineering construction firms, but real estate developers, owners, product designers and makers, and also engaging in partnership with a lot of the existing certification and advocacy organizations. And again, our goal is to try to start to weave a lot of these legacy data silos into a more integrated platform. So uh, what I'll do, I'll walk you through some slides and just to give you an introduction of what Tapstree looks like, and then I'll give you a live demo. Uh, we're very much in sort of the pilot prototype stage. The site is up and running. I'll show you how to access it if you'd like to. We, we love to get feedback from people. A lot of the features and capabilities of Tapestry that have been developed over the past year really came from conversations like this, where we show it and ask questions and get feedback. And I'll show you some examples of some capabilities that we added to Tapestry that came directly from some of the users that were testing it for us. But there's four basic um, kinds of information in Tapestry. It starts with organizations. Obviously, organizations uh, like the firms that all of you work for that both design, engineer, and or build projects or develop projects uh, and or design and manufacture products that are installed and, and make up those projects. And then all three of those things, organizations, projects, and products also, of course, get talked about all the time in the news. We originally didn't really focus on news because there's news all around us, but a lot of people are interested in that only to help connect the dots between what different firms were working on, what products were coming to market, and so forth. So Tapster really tries to tie all four of these things together in an integrated way. In terms of the kinds of information that we track, uh, these are the things that we store in our structured database about organizations. Now the top six are the same kind of things that you might find on LinkedIn when you go to LinkedIn and you look up a company. It's not a big deal. But we've also added a whole other layer of information specific to design and construction, uh, whether it's the projects that a firm worked on, the roles they played, the products they may have designed or manufactured, whether they have parents and subsidiaries, the members of that organization or memberships that that organization uh, has joined, awards and acknowledgments, and of course, the mentions in the news articles. So we really try to connect in a more robust way compared to let's say Facebook or LinkedIn, informations about products and projects and integrate them together. In terms of projects, again, pretty standard information on the top, but what we've also added is a lot of sustainable performance metrics uh, and certifications, but that includes energy use intensity, uh, LPD, daylighting percentage, waste recycle, those kinds of things, even the energy model software and version, along with biophilic features. That was one of the things that we had as a suggestion from one of our users, and now we support that in terms of project information. So you can see there's a real theme about sustainability and resilience built into Tapestry. On the product side, in a similar way, and, and the product world, and we'll get into this a little bit more later, you know, there, there's so darn many certifications out there. It's just the wild, wild west. They're all competing with each other. It's very confusing. Uh, different product manufacturers support different certifications. And yet, underneath those certifications, there's a lot of important information that you want to understand and track and compare, including increasingly things like embodied carbon. How much carbon was involved in the manufacture of a product or the embodied non-renewable energy? or the uh, pre-consumer and post-consumer recycled content. Those are pieces of information that are increasingly being disclosed, but again, they're trapped inside of EPDs or HPDs or other documents, or they're 
five clicks away on a manufacturer's website, it's very, very difficult to get access to that and use it to compare product information. So again, these are the kinds of things that we store in Tapestry about products. And then news, pretty straightforward. Uh, again, we're just sort of a news aggregator. Uh, we don't want to compete with uh, news organizations, we simply provide links to them. We have some visuals, a story excerpt, and we always want to put people back in touch with the original source of the information, whether it's a project profile, whether it's a product on a manufacturer's website, or whether it's actually the original news article. We're just an aggregator that, that gets people connected back to those original sites. So here's one view of information on Tapestry. This happens to be what we call a postcard view. And as you're navigating the menu at the top, and you can, this is, this is now we're looking at organizations, um, you can sort and look and filter by service. You can filter by country. In fact, here we are showing the, country, the uh, organizations in Tapestry that happen to be headquartered in Melbourne. Australia. And so for a company to show up in this filter, that, that's a criteria. That's why some of these firms probably seem familiar. And then again, you can use the menu at the top to drill down even further. If you only want to look at the architecture firms headquartered in Melbourne, um, this is the view of that. So again, each of these postcard views is giving you a little preview of the kind of information about each of those firms in tapestry, whether it's an image in a news article or a project they work on or a product they manufactured. This is just one of the ways, a very visual way to look at information. Here's another uh, grid view, we call it. Here we're looking at architecture firms um, headquartered in New South Wales in the province, any city in New South Wales. And anybody who's worked with databases, that's the beauty of databases. Once you have that data and you give people simple mechanisms to sort and search and filter, you can really start to drill down and get specifically and find more easily what you're interested in. The world of Google and Facebook and Twitter are incredible engines, but they're all primarily unstructured data. They don't present data in a structured way. And we really, in Tapestry, wanted to bring a little more structure to how we organize information and how we allow people to search and filter information. You can also look, since this is a database, at information in a simple tabular or spreadsheet view that'll give you a little more information without all the pretty pictures. So those little icons, in fact, on the upper left are the different view types that we have in Tapestry, whether it's a list view or a grid view or a postcard view or a profile view. For example, here's Woods Baggett's profile as it exists in Tapestry today. They happen to have one project that's published in Tapestry. The firms that they work with to design and construct that project are actually in Tapestry and are displayed there, the news articles. It also includes their description um, from their own website, awards, social media links, uh, founding date, and the locations around the world. So that's the kind of information in a in an organizational profile that Tapestry will display. Here's another one. This is where it gets a little more interesting. EHCD, actually I worked for this firm many decades ago. They're based here in San Francisco. They have quite a few projects uh, published in Tapestry. And what's, what gets interesting is the notion of these project collaborators. Because of all the projects that EHCD worked on, of course, it always takes a village. There's literally dozens, if not hundreds, of organizations that contribute to the design and construction of even an average size project. And the more of that information we can include in Tapestry, the more we can illuminate the collaboration that happens between different firms. So as EHTD puts more and more projects into Tapestry and lists all the other engineers and builders and product manufacturers that participated, then they can actually look at all the firms that they collaborate with. And now there's already 83 and that will be sorted by the firms that they collaborate with most frequently. So it's just an example of how when you put information in a structured database, you can really unlock relationships. And as we all know, this business, no building is designed or built by one person. It's always a team effort involving multiple organizations. And this is the kind of stuff that you're, you can't get to on Facebook or LinkedIn and all these sort of information silos about companies. Here's another view where you're actually looking at the company showing the projects on Tapestry 
that they participated in, whether they were the architect or the engineer or acoustical engineer or what have you. So lots of different views in tapestry that you can get access to information. In terms of projects, here's an example of a project profile. Some of you may be familiar or have seen this project. Uh, here, we're just searching for projects located in Australia. So this is the one that comes up. And of course, there's visual credited photography along with the design and construction team shown. In the demo, I'll show you, you can scroll down and if there are manufacturers that have products installed in this project that can be added to Tapestry, if there's actual products that are installed that can be added to Tapestry as well. So all that information can be combined along with sort of basic project scope statistics and a project scope or project uh, summary. Now I wanna highlight this project because this is where we're starting to illuminate some of these sustainable performance metrics. So when people publish projects on Tapestry, if they want to include things like energy use intensity or lighting power density or the percentage of rain, rainwater managed on site, those kinds of sustainable metrics, we have a place to store them along with, as I mentioned, biophilic design, as well as uh, project certifications like net zero or LEED or, or other certifications. So again, we're just trying to integrate different information into a single location. Now, you might ask me, um, you know, where do, where do we get all this information? And we get it from lots of different places. Typically, we get it from the firms that worked on this project. Again, whether they're a, a designer or an engineer or builder, it doesn't matter. We may get information from a published article. A lot of times, public articles include a listing of the team members and so forth. So there's a lot of sources like that that are already in the public domain that we try to bring into Tapestry. And again, our rule is we only want to publish on Tapestry freely and publicly available information. We don't want to pay for information and we never want to expose information that people don't want to disclose. For example, it, many clients don't want to have people know how much their project costs. And if that's the case, no problem. We just won't track that information. So the rule is it has to be freely given uh, and publicly available information. Here is a postcard view of projects. Again, these are uh, more broadly the kinds of projects that are in the system. Uh, and this is an example of, again, where I think it gets interesting. If we can start to track these performance metrics, you can start to do comparison. And the power of comparison and design is very important. Uh, we just want to know. Who, who's done a great job? And, and between a, a set of buildings, which ones have better performance or worse performance? This is a simple diagram which compares energy use intensity for housing projects in tapestry. And if you can't read the legend, I'll sort of explain it. The, the length of the bar, including the gray and the green, is the energy use intensity, the total EUI for the whole project. And then the green part of the bar is the renewable energy contribution. So if there's solar PV on the roof or there's windmills or there's a purchasing agreement uh, that the client uh, has signed up for that allows them to buy renewable energy, then that renewable energy component shows up. And that's the difference between total energy use intensity and net energy use intensity. Now you notice that that project on the top, it's all green. Well, that means that all the energy that that project needs is supplied by renewable energy. And that's exactly what net zero is. So this is a visual comparison of, of multiple projects showing you the, the variations of the energy use intensity, which is really the, the energy used um, on a square foot or square meter basis, and allowing you to quickly compare them. Here's another example. This is for um, office buildings. And again, I'll highlight the top project, which is actually a net positive project where there's more energy uh, generated by that project than is actually consumed. And when you get to that point, when the green bar actually goes to the left of the line, that's a net positive project. You can see there's a couple of net zero projects below it and then going on from there. So again, the, the idea of tapestry is not just to talk about certifications or gee, you got this award or I'm a net zero or not net zero. But if we know the energy use intensity and we know other uh, sustainable performance metrics that are quantifiable, we can track them and start to compare inside the system. So that's just a real simple example. Here's another one, it's a two by two that actually compares 
EUI and lighting power density. And if you're better than average in both, you're in that magic quadrant, which is highlighted in blue. So you can actually look and seek projects that are doing a good job in both. And if you find one that's interesting or you're filtering by a project type that you're interested and you click on it, go to the profile, see who worked on that project, see what design features uh, are part of that project and so forth. I, one, one of the things that have excited me is as I share this to colleges and universities, they're getting excited about it just as a teaching tool to help their students understand and learn about what it takes to do high performance projects just using these tools to compare. In the product world, uh, it's even a bigger challenge. Here's uh, products from uh, one manufacturer based in Australia, a uh, furniture manufacturer. Again, it's just sort of a grid view of the different products that they bring to market. If you click on one of those, again, you'll get the product, any metrics or information that are known about it, the options that are available. Here's another example. Here's, in this case, it's a Millican carpet where there are some sustainability certifications or documentation, whether it's a you know, living product challenge or an EPD or an HPD or other certifications. If the product has those things, they'll show up here. Uh, and here's one, and we're, we're trying to figure this out. And again, in the spirit of a, a prototype and a pilot, this is very complicated and we're, we're gonna find out whether it's really useful. One of the things in the furniture business that you'll find, and you all know this for people who've picked up furniture, is you have a furniture manufacturer, but then you say, well, what, what are the fabrics I can get on that furniture? And maybe there'll be a PDF document with a big long list of products and their names and who makes them. And then you gotta go to every single one of those and find out what the colors are and what it feels like and what it looks like and so forth. And so in tapestry, we're trying to integrate that where we can say, here's a, here's a couch that was manufactured by Hightower. It's actually designed by Most Modest. We track both the manufacturer and designer. But we also integrate both the product and the fabrics that are available as options to uh, this particular furniture. Um, and so I think the bet is that we want to see if we can make it easier for people as they're searching through products to integrate the fabrics and the furniture in a way that right now you really can't do on even the manufacturer's websites. Because all you get is their pretty picture and then you get a list of fabrics and you got to spend all the time trying to assemble that, putting it together. Uh, and again, there's a tabular view for products. And here, uh, similar to the project world here, we're comparing recycled content for broadloom carpet in the system. And it shows by manufacturer, sorted from best to not so best. Uh, so you can visually see which manufacturers and which products have the highest recycled content. To try to do this manually through going through catalogs or websites is too painful, so nobody does it. So we're trying to make it easier for people to do these kinds of comparisons. Here's an example, and I think this is gonna be increasingly important in the future, is the notion of embodied carbon. As the energy performance of buildings gets better and better, we're left with the dilemma of all the carbon um, that is impacted through the manufacture and delivery and installation of a product. And a lot of manufacturers are starting to disclose the embodied carbon in their uh, products. And as they do that, again, we can compare uh, by types of products, modular carpet, broadloom carpet, resilient tile, what have you. So as manufacturers are disclosing more and more of this information and we can bring it into tapestry, we provide the tools that allow people to make easy comparisons. And then lastly, real quickly, before I dive into a live demo, here's uh, just an example of the news postcard views. Again, uh, you can search by topic, you can search by keyword in the search bar. Here's an example of a news profile uh, where it's both an excerpt from the article, one picture from the article, and then a link to all the organizations that are mentioned in the article. So this is pretty typical about how the news uh, profiles work inside a tapestry. You can also uh, look at the news articles by publisher. There's about, I think, over 250 publishers that we've um, gotten articles published on Tapestry, but we always provide links back to the original publisher. We always credit the original publisher, credit the original author, credit the photography and so forth. So to summarize, I think, and this is another important point I wanna make, I think all of us have a little bit of advertising fatigue when we go onto the internet. Uh, you go to Google nowadays and you know the first page is often just filled with ads. Um, 
And there's a lot of examples of that. I think we all experience this. And so part of what we're trying to do with Tapestry is provide a different kind of environment that's advertising free. So we do not host ads, we never will. We don't have sponsored stories or commission content. We also do not do any user profiling. Access to Tapestry is free and anonymous. Uh, our cookie policy is unique and very simple. We don't use them. And as you all know, if, if a product on the internet is free, it's you that are the product. And so we don't wanna go there. We, it, we're deliberately doing this in a very different way. Where we want it to be open to the public. We want it to be trustworthy. And we don't want to distort the information on Tapestry by advertising and other paid content. We wanna keep it sort of a safe zone in that regard. Now, here's just a simple example, not to pick on Architecture AU. I love that journal, it's, it's a great magazine. But to compare what the website of Architecture AU looks like compared to Tapestry. And most websites nowadays look like this. It's mostly advertising and site navigation. The content, in fact, is very small. So we as a strategy are saying, hey, let's do something different that really highlights and illuminates the content and keeps uh, advertising out of it. Okay. People often ask me, well, what's on Tapestry? You know, how much stuff is there? I think we're just scratching the surface. Um, this is the public content that is currently on Tapestry. We're, we're coming up close to about 12,000 global organizations, over 3,600 articles, uh, approaching 200 different projects designed, but again, by over 2,000 organizations. All of those organizations have their roles assigned to those projects, a uh, couple thousand products, and then all the organizations have social media connections uh, within Tapestry as well. If you wanna go out to LinkedIn or wanna go out to Facebook, you can. And in terms of viewing, actually we just hit 8 million page views last night. Uh, we hope to reach 10 million uh, in the next couple months and we're approaching 50,000 unique IP addresses. That doesn't mean 50,000 human beings, however. A lot of those, some of those are Google robots and hackers from Russia and lots of other things, but, but basically we do track the unique IP addresses of people that are uh, coming to the site, but we actually don't wanna know who they are. And basically, I think the idea behind Tapture, we wanna make it easier for everyone to do the right thing, and we want it to be free, we want it to be open, and as long as the Tapstry exists, that's how it's gonna operate. So now we're not looking at a PDF anymore. This is actually the live site that we're looking at. And again, the, the uh, organizations in Tapestry, uh, you can search by the type of firm you're looking for, you can search by country. Here we're looking for architecture firms in Australia, if you wanted to look for architecture firms in Canada, you click on Canada. If you want to look at um, firms out of Japan, you click on Japan and so forth. So pretty, pretty straightforward in terms of how that works. Now, this notion of headquarter only, you know, if I say any location, what you'll see is many, many other firms show up. Genzer, for example, or AECOM, they're not headquartered in Australia, but they clearly have offices in Australia. So if you're searching for firms that have an office in a location, you can search for it that way. Or if you want, you can only search for uh, organizations that are headquartered in that country. So that's sort of you know how easy it is to navigate around. Uh, if you go to a profile view and click through you know the, the firms that you're interested in, click on these buttons, and that's sort of how easy it is to get around. Again, the profile view, postcard view, grid view, or list view, okay? Um, let's quickly go to news. And, uh, you know, news gets updated frequently on Tapestry. Again, we have about 250 source publications. The only thing I wanna highlight here is the topics because we have made an effort to sort of curate via keyword into different topics. So. When you get thousands and thousands of news articles, in fact, you might be interested in, well, let's say biomimicry. And these are the, the articles that deal with biomimicry. Or let's say COVID. Uh, we try to keep these things up to date. Um, or any, let's say you're interested in autonomous vehicles. So there's both searching capabilities that way. You can also search, let's say I'll type in Gensler. And now it's gonna search for all the news articles that mention Gensler that deal with autonomous vehicles. And there they are. So again, we're trying to keep the interface very simple that you can do a search uh, in the search bar also by the keyword topic and sort of find articles that are of interest. The other thing you can see now that I've typed in Gensler in the search bar, 
it's actually showing me all the news articles and tapestry that mention Gensler in these different topics. Some of them are grayed out. So the ones that are grayed out, there are no articles about disruption that mention Gensler, but there's lots of articles on health and wellness or on EDI or on leadership and so forth. Um, you could do the same thing for any firm or any term that you want up there if you want. Okay, so that's news. Let's quickly go to projects. And again, this is the uh, grid view, profile view. Let's just step through some of these um, different profiles. And this is sort of how straightforward it is. Again, there is we sort by project type. This is the curated list. We have design features. I expect this list to grow over time, but you can search for projects that have chill beams or you know net positive or different kinds of enclosures or interiors and so forth. So again, that's sort of a curated keyword-based feature. Again, you can look at projects by country. If I want to look at Australia, these are the ones that are based in Australia or in the UK or what have you, okay? So we try to keep the interface very lightweight and very simple, but give people a lot of power to sort of drill down into what they're most interested in. And then let me quickly show you again um, let me just go to, let's say, education. And now we're going to say, hey, I want to do an EUI comparison. And again, this is real time, folks. So this is how fast the website works. It probably works a little bit slower in Australia because we got to cross an ocean. But basically, you know, once that information is in the system, displaying it in a graphic format like this is sort of a trivial exercise. So it's very easy to do once that information is known. If I want instead to look at housing projects, or higher education projects or what have you, um, that's all you have to do is, is click on the, the link and you'll get the comparison. And then lastly, um, let's go to products, same kind of thing, the grid view, profile view. We can click through these really quickly, give an idea of the kinds of products and the, the richness of the options I think are really important. It's very difficult to judge a product just by looking at a single picture. So we've invested a lot to sort of build this interface to support uh, rich options. And again, same kind of idea. If we want to say, well, let's look at um, flooring and we'll look here at um, modular carpet, then we can start to look at things like embodied CO2. Okay. Again, this is all real-time demo of tapestry. So once the information is in there and it's quantifiable, so doing these kinds of graphic comparisons um, is pretty easy. So that's sort of a quick walkthrough. Um, that's about 35 minutes. Let's go back to the um, slideshow, if we could, real quick. I'm going to stop this share, and I'm going to share again. And just a couple other things I wanted to highlight again, this notion of tapestry being free and open for as long as a platform is in existence. Um, some people ask me, well, A, how do you contribute content to tapestry? And there's not enough time to get into that here. But basically, we provide for free curator accounts uh, that you can get. We'll give you one. You can log in. We like to do a little bit of training. And once you have a curator account, you can add and update information about your firm. You can add news articles, you can add projects, you can add products, you can contribute content. And again, these are free accounts. We don't charge money for them. Anyone who's interested in that, uh, you can go online to the site and, and put in a request or you can email me either way. And also we are a nonprofit, uh, so we want this to be free forever. So certainly we're always interested in talking to firms that might be willing to not just engage in tapestry and contribute content, but also help fund the activities. Um, so I just to close real quick, and then we can get on to Q&A. This is my contact information. So anybody who's on this that wants to have a follow-up conversation offline, feel free to email me at this address. i be happy to, uh, to talk to you. And then also, in terms of getting access to the site, here's the address. Uh, it's up and running. You're welcome to explore. I'd love to get your feedback and get your ideas and and hear, hear your thoughts on, hey, what's missing? Or maybe we could have this kind of comparative tool or here's some other metrics that you might want to track. That's exactly how we're building 
this is through those kinds of conversations. So feel free to take a look. I'm actually very curious how it performs from Australia. So let me know that too. If it's really too slow, we'll have to maybe get an Amazon server set up over there and do what you do to increase that performance. But, but that's basically it. And with that, I think, uh, Michael, I'll throw it back to you and we can open it up for Q&A. Perfect. Thank you very much, Ken uh, Sanders of, uh, of Tapestry for that program. It's very rare that we often see a software program like Tapestry that is highly impressive. And there's been a number of questions um, and, and almost stems from almost a suspicious standpoint, which is, you know, this is an incredible program. How is it free? And, 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 and one of the questions actually on the chat was related to the fact that, well, if there's no advertising revenue, how does one pay for it? I mean, how, so talk us through the, uh, this is just more just of a interesting before we get into some of the more technical stuff, but yeah, tell me about how it's actually funded because it is, you know, a beautiful site and it costs money. Okay. To yeah. So let me, I'm going to go back to the live site and to, to help answer that question. Um, you're right. And it's an aggressive goal uh, to say, hey, we're going to pay for this without advertising. So we are a nonprofit. So we depend on people who freely contribute information, that curator community I mentioned. And we also we do depend on uh, people who want to fund. Now, actually, um, in fact, I'll uh, maybe go to the FAQ or first the meet. You know, when I first started talking about this, and Maka, you mentioned myself and Jonathan Schechter, set this up, but we reached out to a lot of other industry advisors uh, that are shown here from a lot of different organizations. And some of them actually did step up and contribute. So I contributed some money to the seed funding of AEC Design Transparency. We got some money from Armstrong, from Shaw, from other product manufacturers and other organizations. And that gave us enough money to build the site uh, and to run it on Amazon. And, you know, Amazon's a wonderful platform, a fairly inexpensive service. And as Tapestry grows and scales, we're going to have to invest more in that. But to date, Tapestry has been paid in full by uh, the, the contributing companies that actually donated money to the nonprofit. And that's how we're going to continue to pay for it. Uh, I really, really uh, never want to see advertising on this site. But that means that we're going to have to continue to raise money in the future. Did that answer the question? Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Ken. Just in terms of uh, global reach, you talked about 155 countries that nominate and have joined up from this. Obviously, the examples you've taken us through, and rightly so, have been very much predominantly US-based. Where, I mean, in terms of percentage, is it 90% US content, 10% the rest of the world? Or what roughly ballpark figure could you give us in terms of the, the reach, in terms of engagement of people on the platform? Sure. Okay. So let me, let's just go back to organizations. So if I go to countries here, it sort of shows you uh, the different countries where organizations are in tapestry and sort of the breakdown. You're right. The vast majority are in the U S I think Australia actually um, is number two or three uh, along with great Britain. I'm not exactly sure where they rank, but this is sort of a distribution. So, you know, the, the, the countries you might expect, like Japan and Canada and Australia and Italy and, and Germany and so forth are highly represented. Now, I want to be clear about something. This doesn't mean that 12,000 companies have joined Tapestry and are contributing content. That doesn't mean like that, that at all. There's some firms that are engaged in contributing content, but a lot of other information, again, a curator, uh, if you want to publish a project, and I do this from time to time when I'm, I have some spare time on my hands. If I see a news article that I find interesting, I'll publish it on Tapestry. And if it mentions a firm in that article that's not in Tapestry, I'll go ahead and add it. It's sort of the same way that LinkedIn works. If you notice on LinkedIn or even Facebook, sometimes they'll have stub sites for a firm uh, that is in their system, but the firm itself has never really updated it. And so it doesn't have much information there. We actually take it a bit further. We'll, we'll add information on the firm's behalf. Ideally, of course, we want firms to update their own information. We don't want to do that. We want firms to update their own projects and products. That's the ultimate goal. But to bootstrap this and get sort of a tiny, uh, almost critical mass of content, we spend a lot of time sort of curating content on our own. 
Okay, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Now, one of the other questions that has come in, this relates really to data integrity, to intellectual property. And of course, we know that, especially in the US, in a very litigious corporate and business environment, people are very protective of their data. So the question really relates very much to, and this is a question which has come in on the, our chat box from a gentleman, um, and Mike has asked, look, he's interested in learning how companies protect their intellectual property, especially if all of the firms that are tendering against each other in this very open market, giving away innovative ideas, uh, you know, incorporating them into their projects, only really places them at a disadvantage if um, all tenderers can actually access that data quite freely. What's your response to that? That's a great question. Here's my response. Tapestry is not for intellectual property. Tapestry is for freely disclosed public information. That's all. So any company or individual that has information that they want to hang on to, that they want to keep private, keep private. We'll never ask you for it. We don't want it. I mean, it's, it's, it's that simple. We only want information that people are comfortable sharing. Now, the reality is people share information all the time. You know, when you get published in Architecture AU, you, you give them photography, you give them stats and figures, you give them the team information. We're sharing information all the time. Product manufacturers are sharing information increasingly. Now, that doesn't mean they're, they're releasing their special ink mixture for their carpet. That's private and proprietary. We don't want that. But their recycled content or their embodied carbon or the weight or density of their product those are things that we want to disclose. Now, if, now, we also think that a rising tide lifts all boats, that people who are doing good, who are designing high-performance projects, who are designing high-performance products, they'll want their content and tapestry because when people are looking at them and what they're bringing to market, they're going to look pretty good. And people who have projects that don't perform, maybe they won't put it on tapestry. That's okay. That's okay, too. It's totally up to them. Um, but, but if it means that tapestry tends to be biased more toward high performing projects and products, that's great. To me, that makes it even more valuable because it's challenging all of us to sort of raise the bar and meet standards. I'll tell you two quick stories. You know, one is, and, and we did this a lot at Genzer where we work with a, a client and they'd say, well, you know, we want to go for a lead silver, right? And they have some benchmark goal. Or they, you know, no, we don't want to do net zero, but maybe we want to cut our energy use by 20%. And then by educating them, you can help your clients stretch. You can say, well, actually, we can help you get to 50% reduction. We can help you do lead platinum, but you got to got to work with them. And some of these comparison tools, you can say, hey, I know you, you didn't think a housing project could do this, but let me show you some housing projects that either we've done or other people have done that actually are much more ambitious. So you can help stretch your clients. Um, the other thing about trustworthy information, I was presenting this uh, in Canada one time and I was showing a project and a structural engineer said, wait a second, that wasn't our role. We, were, we, we played this role. And I said, oh, okay, no problem, we'll fix that. Because we got that from a published article and that was the role that the structural engineer was given but they actually knew what their correct role was. So we quickly updated it. So it's really, it's a crowdsourced kind of approach. The data is never going to be perfect. The information is never going to be perfect. Sort of like Wikipedia. In fact, one way to think of tap three is a big data Wikipedia. It's the community that's contributing and curating content and is really responsible for the quality. But again, if you have anything private or secret or proprietary, don't publish it. We don't want it. It's that simple. Nice and easy. Very simple guidance there. Thanks, Ken. Um, now, another question. This is in relation to chain of custody. So clients are becoming much more sustainably aware. They're becoming much more conscious of where origins the products uh, originate from uh, when any sort of build is being developed. And so it is now becoming more than ever really very necessary to track the origin of products, that chain of custody, and hence not assess, not I suppose to assess only the, the sustainability of the item, but also from a social impact as well. So in terms of, you know, issues that may arise later, um, from one of the sources, you can track the origin of the products, especially in the age of the digital twin, when you've got that digitally trackable sort of twin for the operations and maintenance side of things. Do you see Tracker, uh, Tapestry rather, having a, um, a, a solid assistance in, in providing assistance in that area? Yes. In fact, we already track country of origin. Maybe it wasn't on the list, but we, we tracked that. 
the the tricky part of it is sometimes you'll have a manufacturer like Armstrong that has three factories in the U.S. One's in California, one's in Texas, and one's in New York. Um, or they may have two factories in two different countries, the same product. And so it's not always that every product comes from one country, but you're absolutely right. If we want to be responsible, uh, especially about embodied carbon, and we want to manage our supply chain better, knowing where products come from is essential. So where that information is known, uh, that's in tapestry. And actually, when you look at a product profile, you'll see many of them, mostly the small stuff like the carpeting and the tiles, will show the country of origin. So we do already track that. Uh, and we hope that more and more uh, manufacturers will disclose that. Now, the reality is there's a lot of manufacturing going on in China versus the U.S. Well, there's actually more and more people who are interested in where is this stuff being made and what's the environmental responsibility of the factory. And, and there's all kinds of future layers of information. So I, I couldn't agree more. Yes, that's important. And yes, we track it. I'm conscious that in San Fran it's getting dark, so you are slowly but surely oh. evolving into a silhouette. You well, may need to go and just pop a light on in your room if that's okay, Ken. Yeah, let me. Let me. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. No, that's okay. Um, it, it, there we go. Okay. So um, we'll let you go and have your dinner on a, what is your Wednesday evening shortly. Just a couple more questions, if you can, just bear with us. Um, just some, I want to ask you a question related to contractual metrics. Uh, and this is just a question which has come in from the chat. Um, and, and this is a question from someone who's asking, do you offer more softer variables in your data sets that may help people on the platform investigate procurement paths and contract types that designers are contracted on. What we're looking at is um, trying to ascertain detail where designers are novating. Uh, what's your response to that question? Are you talking about fees or, or something broader? Uh, preferably something broader. So not related so much to fees is actually novating the work onto another provider. Um, do you offer any sort of information on that per se? Oh, where where this, this um, firm um, worked on the project, but they actually subcontracted another firm. Correct. And how do we expose that? Yeah, basically, again, it's all about disclosure and what people want to know. Now, I'll tell you right now, if, if somebody hired a firm to do a scope of work and behind the scenes, they outsource some of that work to another party, but they would rather not that be disclosed, it won't get disclosed and it won't show up in tapestry. If they do want to disclose and they do want to give credit to their subcontractor, someone they've hired to assist them, then it'll show up. So it's really going to be governed by the willingness of the party to disclose that information. We remain very agnostic about that. Again, we're not interested in banging the table and demanding information from people. The market will find its own balance about what people want to disclose and, and not disclose. But I think people by and large and companies by and large, they absolutely want to disclose more and more when it demonstrates their competitiveness, when it demonstrates their innovation, when it demonstrates their commitment to sustainability, they'll contribute a lot of stuff. And so we'll wave that in, but we're much more focused on encouraging those people who want to contribute than fighting the battle for stuff that people want to keep private. Mm, true. That's it from the questions that have come in on the chat. But I will say just to remind everybody on the chat again, for those people who have been sending me a couple of quick questions offline, to get access into Tapestry, again, the website, please, Ken. It's http colon slash slash tapestry dot click. Don't put in a www. We kept it really simple. Tapestry dot click. So tapestry. if you go into the search bar in your browser, just type in tapestry dot click. That will get you there. Great stuff. Well, we may leave it there, Ken. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Tapestry sounds fascinating. There's a lot of information in there to unpack, and I'm sure that a lot of us will be now jumping onto tapestry.click. We'll be going to have a look at that. It will help us here in Australia. I see that there's a good take-up level for Tapestry here in Oz, so hopefully after today you may actually see that rise, which is great. So thank you very much. And we acknowledge it is late where you are or somewhat late, so please do go and enjoy dinner at uh, over in the US and um, we do thank you very much for uh, your contribution to our lean in today. It's really appreciated. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Michael, very much. Thanks. 
So that is it for our lean in today. And thank you so much for joining me. I will say if you've got a pen, just scribble down some notes for me, if that's okay. Next Tuesday, uh, now cast your mind back. Remember back in mid-May, I had Andrea Lucina Orr from Dulux come in and she had presented one of our most impressive and widely attended and most downloaded sessions, which was all about the science of color. Ever since May, I've had a number of people come to me and say, Michael, we want to see that happen again or a different presentation. So Andrea from Dulux is joining me on Tuesday next week to go through the color forecast charts, what's happening in the world of architecture and what's the latest and greatest stuff coming out of the paint factories. So do join me on that. It will be slightly interesting, um, or not slightly interesting, but it will be fairly fascinating in terms of what um, architects are specifying on walls. That's Tuesday. Then Thursday, what we are doing is we're doing a copywriting uh, masterclass. So if you're needing assistance in your architectural practice to help develop, you know, your uh, articulate your value propositions and that kind of stuff, join me on Thursday for a copywriting masterclass. So you've got two fascinating stu- uh, events next week, Tuesday, Dulux, Thursday, copywriting masterclass. That's it. So do go and enjoy Tapestry, tapestry.click. And I'm um, looking forward to catching up with you all next week. Thanks again for your attendance. And of course, as I always say, um, it's been great to have you with me. But um, I'm Michael Inky here at the Institute of Architects. Until next week, do stay safe. Look forward to catching up with you soon. Thanks very much.